A lot of exciting chess was played in round two of the 2019 FIDE World Cup in Conti Monsisk, but perhaps no game has been more talked about than the Queen's sacrifice that went down between Nisipianu and Nakamura. Now, a lot of videos have been made about this game, and full disclosure, I delayed my publication just because I wanted to dive a little bit deeper, maybe bring some different viewpoints and provide some insights into the critical moments that perhaps haven't really been discussed yet. So without further ado, let's jump right into what happened. Starts out with one knight f3, but really this was a d4 opening. Uh, we had c4 with all types of potential transpositions you can get, queen's indians, back to queen pawn games, and that's what we had. And then white chose g3 not too long after. Very often at the high levels these days, you see the Catalan as a weapon of choice. Now the main idea of the Catalan, removing the bishop from its natural diagonal where it guards the c4 pawn in a queen's gambit, is because you're hopeful that when that tension breaks, your bishop becomes a very, very powerful dictator in the longest diagonal of the board. Uh, if black wants to play positions to avoid that, you can always go for c6. These are the closed, sometimes they call it the neo-Catalans. Uh, these positions, sometimes you can later prepare to take and play b5. Uh, you can also just try to fight white in terms of the tension here. But ultimately, a lot of these lines, if white eventually gets e4, black can feel that he's slightly worse and, and not having as much fun. So we know Hikaru Nakamura wants to play some sharp chess, and he plays d takes c4. Now, Hikaru is not necessarily known as an expert in the Catalan, but as I reviewed this variation, he's played this position many times with both colors, actually. In fact, one of the more popular games was one where he was white in this position, against Rajabov from this year, actually, in Moscow, uh, 2019. Hikaru actually played knight e5, and after Rajabov played c5, they eventually drew that game uh, not too long after uh, in, in uh, this, this variation right here. So some pieces were traded, and they decided to, to call it equal. So just to point out, Hikaru knows these lines really well for both sides. After knight e5, he decided to go for a line, uh, a road slightly less traveled. That's with queen to d6, again, rather than what Rajabov played against him, c5. So the point of queen to d6 is that if white takes on, on c4 right away, let's say, instead of uh, what Nisipianu did, the queen comes to a6 with tempo, uh, and then in a lot of lines, black will still be striving for c5. If white plays queen to b3 to defend the knight, black will play knight c6 to get a more traditional Catalan development. Um, and now with the queen on b3, rather than its traditional d1, d4 is under fire. So th there's a lot to these variations, but it, it seems that white's getting the best chance at an edge with what Nisipiano did, which was castles, not knight takes c4. Again, if we're explaining the big picture here for everyone's level of chess understanding, if white recaptures this pawn and black has done nothing to change the structure, look for white to get a very, very nice and comfortable advantage with two pawns in the center and very good minor pieces kind of chasing around the lady here. So that puts some emphasis, right, emphasis on the right syllable if we're thinking, what exactly does black need to do to stop that? Well, black has to either try to hold on to the pawn to prevent it from just being taken back where white gets a big center, or he needs aggressive counterplay against the center before white can establish said pawn structure. So these are sort of the storylines to understand about what both sides want here and why Nakamura plays queen a6. Now, after a4 to prepare the b5 square for the knight, one option for black is actually c6. Um, I, I didn't spend a lot of time, I wasn't prepared to go into that variation very much in the video, but again, you can check out my blog at chess.com. Uh, mentioned that c6 is another way that would have avoided the sharp variations that happened in this game. Hikaru plays knight c6. He was still playing very, very fast uh, on site at the tournament, and after knight to b5, you have to deal with the c7 pawn. So if you're not prepared to start making passive retreating moves, the variation we're now going for is very forced. Um, again, if you didn't want knight b5, you should have played c6. Again, I look at that line a little bit more in my blog. You can check out. Knight takes e5 is played, and after d takes e5, we get rook d8. Again, Hikaru is still playing very fast. Now, uh, a lot of people looked at e takes f6 as kind of like a brilliant, right, double exclam idea for white. I'm here to kind of tell you a little bit of a different story. Uh, looking at this line, I don't think that e takes f6 was really anything more than a potential draw offer. And I'm going to show what I think the most forcing, most likely variation was that Hikaru prepared before he got a little mixed up. 
one of the things that can happen when you play a position so often from both sides, white and black, white and black, is you feel like you just know it inside and out, right? And sometimes that can lull you into a trap of thinking you're playing, you're seeing it like the back of your hand, and then you start to phase it in. You're like, oh, that's not my hand. That's a that's a hamburger or a baby's butt, right? I know that sounded weird, but the point is, without focus, you don't always know what you're looking at. And sometimes when you're playing too fast in these events, that can happen, right? So that's not necessarily meant as criticism for Hikaru, more of kind of justification as to what happened. How did he forget his prep? And, and that's what I think, because he really does know these positions for both sides. So Nisipianu played E takes F6. Um, I actually believe uh, pretty strongly after looking at this line for a while, probably spent more time analyzing it, should have just done this video for you. I think Queen C2 is, is probably really where white needs to go if you really are playing these positions for a win. Um, but E takes F6 after the move Rook takes D1. Note, of course, that f takes d7 doesn't work uh, because if rook takes d1 and then bishop d7, you guard the queen, and after queen c6, you eventually get the knight back on a8. So that was a variation that wasn't really talked about in a lot of videos, and I think it's critical to point out that as much as it looks like white gets a lot of material here, in fact, the line could continue with bishop before and rook c1, I think probably only black is going to be the one who has winning chances in these lines, though the engines do say it's, it's close to unclear. So... That variation, probably Hikaru was prepared to play close to unclear. Um, instead, of course, Nisipiano took on d1. And after bishop d6, we get bishop f4. Now, the move that Hikaru played here was played very fast. Again, I think it was preparation confusion, so to speak, based on how well you know a line. Um, but there are two other moves, right? c3 is a move that black can play, I think, if you, if you think you have winning chances. But after b takes c3 and the same type of breakthrough on the d-file... G takes F6, C4, and then C5 is achieved. And I don't think that this is the line that Hikaru would have gone for. I think that this is an endgame where white has plenty of compensation for the queen, and probably black is struggling to complete development without B7 ever falling in these lines. So that, that's not what I anticipate. I, I think what Hikaru did was confuse that he intended to get a draw as black. Again, in the World Cup, remember, you play with both colors. So a draw as black here would not have been a bad result for Nakamura. He would have then taken the white pieces and had a chance to win without tie breaks in the next round. And I think the variation that gets a draw by force is queen a5. Because in these positions, I analyzed it for a while, and really, white doesn't have anything better than bishop d2, queen to b6. Now you go to e3 with tempo. The queen's only real square is either back to a5 or a6. And if you go to a6 and bishop f4, well, Bob's your uncle. We're right back where we started, and the queen goes back to a5, right? So I looked at this line for a while, tried to anticipate what else could have been possible, and I think Hikaru just confused his line and had every intention of getting a peaceful result here. Um, instead of playing queen a5, he played e5 way too quickly, and before you know it, white's just winning. Um, bishop takes e5 is, is another, I don't necessarily want to say more accurate way to play. I actually think knight takes d6 was fine for Nisipianu, because if e takes f4 was played, the position is still pretty easily winning with knight e8 and rook d8. Uh, the attack is commencing, and if you take f6, it doesn't really help you. Rook a to d1, the bishop on c8 is pinned, and, uh, black has problems. So, so I don't know that knight takes d6 was really any worse than taking e5, and after takes, you take... Obviously, the biggest point is that if you capture, we have back rank problems, right? Jay-Z wrote a rap song about that. He's got 99 of them. You don't want that. Queen a5, rook takes d6, and here comes the back rank, and with it, just an initiative that the queen can never deal with. This is the queen's worst nightmare, when normally the way that the queen can outplay the pieces are you have an open king, you have weaknesses on both sides of the board, let's say, so she can kind of pop back and forth and flex, so to speak, right? Show why she's a more powerful piece than a rook and a bishop. Positions like this, where there are really no weaknesses in white's camp for the queen to target, the king is safe, and the pieces are coordinated, this doesn't spell good stuff, and... It's exactly the kind of position where you don't need a queen, right? Who needs a queen in these types of positions? Because all of White's pieces are working so well together. Um, and honestly, they just they just come to life here. Bishop takes b7. Of course, the queen can't capture because rook d8 is still checkmate. I, uh, I You know, it, it's really difficult because this position is probably already completely lost for black. Bishop takes b7. The rook came to d8 trying to hold on. And then I really like Nisipiano's move. You can pause the video here if you want to work on your practical practical conversion skills. Just stop all your opponent's counterplay. Bishop f3. Trade off the only active piece that black actually has, and in doing so, the double pawns actually make this little safety net for the king even better, right? So it's just so hard to imagine black getting counterplay. White now wiggles his way toward increasing the threats on the d8 square by getting this bishop on the dark square diagonal involved. 
Um, C3 really just desperation because it's a matter of time before a threat of Rook D8 comes and Black just resigns. Um, Rook D8 will not only probably win the queen and maybe the rook, but trying to run off the back rank runs into things like rook takes F7, and you've got just as many problems. So I didn't spend a lot of time here going through what I thought was a very, very straightforward, albeit very nice conversion. We don't see queen sacrifices that often. But to me, I, I looked at it, and I hate to take away some of the you know, the, uh, the, the hot air behind this game, but I really think that it was not the worst approach from Hikaru. Um, and uh, if he had played Queen A5, he would have been in okay shape. So thanks for, uh, thanks for watching the video. Thanks for watching all of our coverage from, the, uh, from my studio for the 2019 FIDE World Cup. Give us a like, give us a subscribe, and uh, we'll see you around on chess.com.